I'm start by saying that uh, in my his in my reading of history, uh, we're at a fairly unique moment when it comes to uh, privacy and openness. We're dealing with issues that we've never had to deal with before. I'll go ahead and put to the first slide now. Um, and my work actually largely deals with human identity. And when I say that, I don't mean like your driver's license and you know your website logins. I mean the stories that you tell yourself and others about who you are and uh, therefore what matters to you and what you are can or able to do. And um, I should say start straight out that, uh, that I don't feel like I have answers. Um, in fact, if I do my job right, uh, you'll have fewer answers by the end of this talk. But hopefully your questions will be more interesting. Um, when we talk about privacy and secrecy, we use them interchangeably, and I want to unpack that real quick because they're not interchangeable ideas. Uh, privacy, secrecy is, has always been uh, a technical construct, whereas privacy has always been social norms. Privacy has never actually been something that we did with technology. It's been something we did with each other. Um, and uh, secrets are, for the most part, boring. Secrets are usually in modern society strings of numbers. When we talk about identity theft, we don't generally talk about identity the way I mean. We talk about secrecy theft. Nobody steals somebody's identity and then walks around telling people that they like anime and didn't like their mother's cooking just because you know they stole the identity of, of an Akira fan who can't stand any more of that damn meatloaf. It's not how that works. <laughs> um, and that's that second that second identity is the one that I'm talking about. Um, uh, and uh, I want to talk about what privacy means because it doesn't mean what we're talking about for the most part. Um, this is, uh, privacy is highly social for one thing. Uh, part of privacy is not only that we share it but that we need to and want to share it. But we want to control who we share it with. Um, and, uh, and this right here, this event is the height of privacy as a social construction. This is an Al Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. and. Um, the environment that's created in Alcoholics Anonymous in these meetings is one where um, the, the privacy social camaraderie allows people to talk about the most highly personal things that they could possibly talk about. But it has no technical or legal enforcement. As a matter of fact, that private social magic would be destroyed by any kind of enforcement. Um, and, uh, and what they accomplish in AA is amazing, and they accomplish it completely separate from any kind of enforcement measures, uh, just by promise, uh, the promise of trust and trust. But, and uh, here's the interesting point, I got this picture of an AA meeting off the internet. <laughs> um, the internet is, uh, is a technical construct that is fairly uniquely incapable of, um, of uh, respecting social norms. As a matter of fact, you could kind of describe the internet as uh, like the biggest Asperger's patient in the universe, peering over your shoulder every day, recording everything you do. The default behavior of the internet, to some degree, is save everything and transmit upon request. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's who we're dealing with now, being in the room with us most of the time. Um, and, uh, and the internet doesn't, the internet, but the biggest destruction of our pri privacy that comes out of the internet is the destruction of what I think of as the fourth dimension of privacy, which is ephemerality. And in fact, our ability to forget is key. It's incredibly important to identity formation. Our ability to forget who we were is how we become someone new. Our ability to forget what other people do is how we give them permission to change over time. The internet doesn't forget. It loses things occasionally, but that's different than forgetting. And it remembers your past just as well as it remembers your present. It doesn't let things fade with time. I love this quote. <laughs> All of us occasionally need to lie, even by omission, uh, even if just by omission, uh, in order to get through life. Because the, the secondary side of this is that um, it is very, very important that we learn in society to mind our own business and to let other people mind their own business. And minding your own business is pretty much the best social lubricant we ever invented. Um, now, weirdly, there's some really good benefits to the, uh, the way the net has exposed us, actually. I mean, there are the, the benefits, the positive benefits of affinity networking are so valuable to our quality of life that we are beginning to give up on much of the privacy for fairly good reasons. Um, and, uh, and privacy, to some degree, as a friend of mine said, is the enemy of, of association. 
Um, and as we kind of are exposing more and more people and understanding the lives of more and more different people, we kind of do build in a little bit of tolerance to our way of thinking, or at least we have the potential to. Um, we have the potential to understand that we are not alone in a way that we never had before. Um, and we're cur encouraged to open up more. We see the edges of our own homophilies for the first time, that, that tendency to group together with people that are very like us. And for the very first time, we see that um, maybe living in a homophily isn't the best way to live. Uh, and that's as innovative and special as anything we ever invented in the 20th century. Um, but, um, so my hope originally about that kind of breakdown of homophily and, and openness is that it would lead to a society of a kind of cognitively enforced tolerance, where if you knew what everybody had been and what everybody had done, you couldn't be an asshole about it anymore. Um, but as I have grown older and learned more, um, I think the reason that's not going to work is best exemplified by the very best named logical fallacy ever, which would be the no true Scotsman fallacy. And no true Scotsman works like this. A Scotsman reads in the newspaper that, uh, that a man was um, killed uh, very brutally and you know, that, that a man killed someone very brutally and he goes, no, no Scotsman would ever do that. And he reads ne next week about a Scotsman who kills a man very brutally and he says, no, no true Scotsman would ever do that. And it's this kind of rationalizing is kind of like the, the dark side to our ability to um, uh, be very facile in our thinking. And it's universal. We all do no true Scotsman sometimes. And that's why you can have a lot of openness and still a lot of people, uh, vulnerable populations being persecuted. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, there's some argument that the vulnerable populations um, will become less vulnerable over time, even if they're more vulnerable and approximate when their privacy disappears. Um, it's probably a little bit true. It's really hard to tell the current generation to just suck it down, though. A um, little, little bit of a, wait, <laughs> that's not my next slide. <laughs> my next slide is not here. <laughs> that's all right. Um, in 2007, in a feat of peak, I'm not going to deny that, I deleted myself off the internet one day. I, um, I, made my old, my, I took down my blog, I made my old post non-readable, -read I deleted my Twitter account, I, uh, I kept my Flickr, <laughs> but um, I, I, uh, I canceled my live journal all in one day. And as I, I just decided to do it, and, um, and I remember thinking at the time that the grown-up thing to do here is to sleep on it, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to lose the momentum. I wanted to take the anger I had at the time and just do it. And I did it. And in three years since then, I have never for a moment regretted it. And let me just describe, from 1994 to 2007, I had taken all of you with me on the internet and everything I'd done, just about. You had been there for the death of my father and the birth of my daughter, which was belonged on Boing Boing. <laughs> you, you had been there for the beginning and end of my marriage. You had been there through my peripatetic career path from like sysadmin to school teacher to stand-up comic and eventually all the way to journalist. And, uh, and I had felt your eyes on me the whole time. Not in specific, but not in particular, but in general. And, uh, and I realized as I was going through the process of deleting myself that what I was looking for was not what I had thought of as reclaiming privacy, but that my personal life had become a kind of performance, that I was carrying it with me around all the time. And I wanted you to get your kicks elsewhere. I just wanted to be boring for a while. So I've realized in the time since then, I have a new domain. <laughs> I write new things on the internet. That um, I even have a new Twitter account. <laughs> um, I realized in the time since then that I was doing the best equivalent I could to moving away and starting again. And I was doing it right on the cusp of being able to do it. Um, we're, uh, we're taking that privacy away from ourselves and our children. And the, uh, the same friend um, that I mentioned before also said, everyone who grows up in the society is an expert in brand management. And I think that's too much to ask of our children. I think that's a bad social norm. But I don't think this looks like legislation. I think this looks like new social norms. It looks like, maybe it looks more like personal space. We negotiate when and where we're allowed to touch people. We don't enforce that, but we do all learn it. And uh, maybe we need to learn how to not ask questions we don't want the answers to. Um, and I'm hoping that as we learn, 
how to let go of each other's privacy, the internet can no longer invade our sense of self quite as much as it can right now. Thank you.